Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very glad to have you joining us uh, for what's going to be a great uh, conversation with uh, a truly, truly great author, uh, David Morrell. Um, I'm Dan, I am the Director of Development and Programming for the Bedford, Bedford Playhouse, I can speak. Um, we're very uh, glad we're able to do this virtual programming uh, as part of our virtual Playhouse series. Um, although we're closed for now, uh, we are committed to bringing you programming of this nature and keeping our community uh, engaged and connected. So we realize these are difficult times and we hope if you enjoy tonight and you're able, please take a moment before you turn off your device to visit our website, which is www.bedfordplayhouse.org. Uh, and consider please making a donation to help us through while our doors are closed. It's tax deductible. Uh, it's a great way to uh, help us uh, support the community and bring culture and uh, programming and everything we could try to do while our doors were open uh, in this new reality. Uh, there's a ways to give link on the side which you can click on. You might also want to consider becoming a member. Uh, that membership has benefits uh, such as discounts on programs and films and in invitations for uh, upcoming events. We have a special members only uh, uh, program happening a week from tomorrow, which is an interview with uh, a great screenwriter named John Bricado. Uh, we are also doing curbside concessions uh, tomorrow. There's still time to order uh, to help you get you through your weekend. Uh, popcorn, candy, drinks, uh, different packages are available. That's all on our website and members get discounts on that too. Uh, so thank you again for attending. That was the commercial. And now for the program. Uh, very, very uh, thrilled to have David Morrell with us tonight. Uh, he is um, certainly well known for uh, many of his books. Uh, he was from originally Kirch uh, Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and in 1960, at the age of 17, he became a fan of the classic TV series Route 66. Some of you may remember that. Uh, and the scripts combined with the action and ideas impressed him so much he decided to become a writer. So he moved to the United States to study at Penn State and he received his MA and PhD in American literature. Uh, First Blood, which is considered the father of modern uh, action novels, was published in 1972 while he was a professor at the English department at the University of Iowa. And he taught American literature there from 1970 to 1986 He's written many other novels, including the Spy Trilogy, uh, The Brotherhood of the Rose, The Fraternity of the Stone, and The League of Night and Fog. He's the author of more than 30 books altogether, including The Naked Edge, Creepers, The Spy Who Came for Christmas, um, and especially near and dear to my heart, he's written some comic book series featuring characters like Captain America and Spider-Man and, and Wolverine. Uh, he's a co-founder of the International Thriller Writers Organization, He's an honorary lifetime member of the Special Operations Association and the Association of Intelligence Officers. He's been trained in firearms, hostage negotiation, uh, executive protection, uh, numerous other action skills that he describes in his novels. So he knows from whence he speaks. Uh, his latest novels, Murder is a Fine Art, Inspector of the Dead and Ruler of the Night are Victorian mystery thrillers that explore the world of 1850s London. He's an Edgar Anthony Thriller and Arthur Ellis finalist, a Nero and McCavity winner, and a three-time recipient of the Distinguished Bram Stoker Award from the Horror Writers Association. Uh, he's gotten the prestigious Career Achievement Thriller Master Award from the International Thriller Writers Organization. Uh, and so I'm very, very pleased to welcome David Morrell uh, to our virtual playhouse. Uh, there he hey, is. Here hey, I David, am. How are you? But through the magic of virtual reality, here I am. That's right. Uh, I should just quickly mention to all of our attendees that if you are on your laptop, uh, there's a Q&A button uh, that should be at the bottom of your screen. If at any point you'd like to post a question, uh, we will pose it to David uh, at some point during the evening. Um, he might actually cover it before that, but uh, please feel free to at any point ask a question. Um, we're going to start off with a couple of questions that I think uh, everybody's going to be fascinated to hear. And so the first question I have for you, David, is it true that Stephen King used First Blood as a text when he taught creative writing at the University of Maine? It is true. Uh, Steve, uh, in 19, 
78 uh, taught creative writing at uh, fiction writing at the uh, University of Maine. And he had two texts. One was First Blood and the other was uh, Double Indemnity by uh, James M. Cain. And uh, this, 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 well, uh, plus there's, uh, to me, this is interesting technically because Cain is one of the people I learned from uh, between uh, 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 double indemnity and um, oh come on the famous one help postman me out always here. rings twice the postman always rings twice um, I uh, learned uh, when when you read those books the technique is so upfront uh, that uh, it, uh, it's it's by osmosis almost that you can absorb the the what the way he writes. And, but he wasn't quite Stephen King at that point yet, right? He uh, well, he no he'd published Salem's Lot. Uh, I'm pretty sure he published The Shining. Um, uh, so, uh, but he wasn't, I mean, it became for, for his career, we, we became friends from about 1980 to about 1995. We were, we were, we were close and talked often and we took some road trips together and things like that. After, I, I don't want to make a mystery of it, in 1995, his career went so high and and so wide that um the kinds of social relationships he had before that simply you know just hanging around with people it wasn't possible in the same way so um uh, but he used to send me uh, uh first draft uh typescripts so i had uh, typescripts of it and misery in the dark half and things like that and, and recently uh with his permission although i did own the the manuscripts uh, these were auctioned for a children's cancer fund, uh, research cancer fund, in the name of uh, my son and my uh, granddaughter who died from cancer. Uh, so we, uh, we collected like $60,000 from the manuscripts that he had given me over the years. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right, well, enough about Stephen King. Let's talk about you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, when we talked briefly yesterday, you had mentioned that when you were, I guess, uh, uh, f working on the first draft of First Blood, or around, you were about to finish it, and yeah. uh, you were struck by a few um, historical events that were occurring at the time. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Um, this sure. Is like, I guess 1970-ish. Yeah. No, I know what you're referring to, and actually, it, uh, it's the uh, Kent State shootings uh, 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 in 1970 in May. Um, um, you know, uh, May it was 50 years ago. Um, but uh, it, the impetus for the book actually for First Blood goes back to 68. Uh, First Blood is a, is a kind of an allegory. It's about the, the, uh, uh, a kind, my version of what would happen if the Vietnam War came home to America and the deep violent divides that separated America were played out in this mini war. Uh, so Rambo represented a disaffected, I mean, it's almost as if he went to war, he came back hating what he'd been through and became, for those of people who from those days will recognize as students for a democratic society and how extreme they were. Uh, whereas the police officer would then represent the other side. Uh, if we look at say what happened at the democratic convention in Chicago in 68, where we had a riot on the streets outside the convention. Uh, and I was, as a Canadian, uh, struck by the, by what I thought was going to be a civil war. It was, it was that violent, unless anybody think I'm exaggerating. In 1968, there weren't 10 riots, there weren't 20 riots, 20 riots, there weren't 50 riots, there were several hundred riots. Most of them related, well, all of them related either to the war or to, toward racial issues. And the racial issues pertain to the war because an undue proportion of blacks were drafted to Vietnam because they couldn't get education deferments. Uh, and uh, to this day, there are some cities such as the, uh, Detroit, Gary, Indiana, parts of Los Angeles and so on who never recovered from those riots. And I was watching them on TV, uh, on news, and I was struck that these, it was almost as if, if we closed, if we, if we shut off the sound, it was like we were watching 
a firefight in Vietnam. Or if, uh, uh, or on the other hand, if we looked at the firefight in Vietnam, it was almost like, I mean, think of it, National Guardsmen were patrolling American streets that were ablaze and, and cars were ablaze and, and, and uh, uh, businesses had been, had been trashed. And, and moving forward to uh, the Kent State event, in May of, of uh, 1970. And I, uh, I want to couch this in a way that's similar to the novel. If First Blood tries to balance the two violent opposing forces that were taking place in America at that time, Kent State, what happened there sort of illustrates that we have students demonstrating against the war. Rocks were thrown. There, uh, on the other hand, we have a National Guardsmen with um, loaded weapons and whatever the hell happened shots were fired students were wounded students were killed so depending on where you're coming from at this event there are some people who will say well those students asked for it and there'll be some people who say those guardsmen should never have had live ammunition and should never have fired we can go around that but the novel was basically dealing with those issues the movie takes the book in a different direction. It's the same plot, but it reinterprets the story because a movie in 1982 isn't going to be relevant to 1972 when the book came out. Right. So um, we'll, we'll talk about the movie in a, in a few minutes. Um, with regard to the character of Rambo, which you know has become such an iconic character, I think certainly al almost, if not on the same level as James Bond, maybe. Um, did that surprise you? I mean, did you have anybody, was there anybody in mind specifically that you were basing the character on or was it just sort of a compilation of out of your imagination? No, I had, I had somebody very definitely in mind and he, he was Audie Murphy, who was America's um, most decorated soldier from World War II. Um, and what Audie Murphy did in combat makes anything Rambo in my novel or on the screen uh, 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 did uh, to be... Um, I, I mean, it just doesn't compare. The, the citation for Murphy's Medal of Honor is, uh, is harrowing. It just, it, it, it's impossible to imagine someone doing that. Murphy, and, re, and remember, I'm of, of a generation where in my youth, I watched Audie Murphy in Westerns in theaters. And I had no idea that he'd been a soldier until I saw him playing himself. I love the meta on this. Murphy playing himself in a movie based upon a book that he supposedly wrote or at least endorsed to Helen back. And, and I'm thinking, oh, this guy did all this in real life as well as what he did in the Westerns. And if you look at Murphy's Westerns, um, the, probably the, the, the best of the smaller budgets is something called No Name on the Bullet, where Murphy, all dressed in black, rides into a town and simply by being in the town causes everybody to go crazy. Uh, the, the, uh, the guilty all start, they're sure he's there to shoot them. Uh, I mean, and all he does for most of the movie is sit on a chair outside a rooming house. Uh, but the power of this baby-faced Texan to radiate lethal intent um, uh, is what made him a movie star. He, he made a movies too, The Unforgiven, for example, with Burt Lancaster and, and Gene Simmons. Um, uh, uh, but uh, anyhow, he fascinated me. He was he was uh, charged with um, uh, he, 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 he wasn't found guilty, but he had to go to court. He had pistol whipped a man who he said had overcharged to train the dog of a friend of his. Um, there, there are stories of him on set and a, a, a assistant director um, bullying his female co-star, making her cry, and Murphy coming over to him and saying, if you do that again, I'll kill you. And if you, the word that people had knowing Murphy was that you could see in his eyes he meant it. So the, where this relates to Rambo is that Murphy suffered from what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. And he had nightmares from the war. He had trouble sleeping. He kept a, a, a 45 
um, a semi-automatic under his pillow. Uh, he woke up in the night thinking he was still at war shooting. Um, and when he was on location, it, it was a bit of a problem because they were renting rooms and they'd have to move the, the pictures on the wall around to disguise the bullet holes. Uh, and so my, my thought about this was, if I was going to bring the war home, who, who would, why not pretend it was Audie Murphy coming back from Vietnam? Now, let's do another time travel here. My mustache was grown in 1968 as part of my research. And uh, people who lived at that time know what I'm talking about. People who didn't might think I'm exaggerating, but I am not. If you had facial hair or long hair, you were an automatic target for abuse from the authorities. I could not walk down the street without a police officer, for example, making rude remarks to me. Uh, the the reason I grew the mustache, I, I could have I could have gone farther, but I'm Canadian, so I you know to me this was a protest. Uh, uh, the, what I was doing was imagining what if Rambo came back from the war and what if he became sort of like a hippie? What if he dropped out and wandered across the United States to see what the country was like and what he'd been fighting for? And based upon a real event in New Mexico, I live in New Mexico and this happened in New Mexico, a group of, of hippies traveling through and I no longer remember the name of the community, were stopped for vagrancy, were shaved, were trimmed bald, and were kicked out of town. And this stayed in my mind and I thought, well, let's say Audie Murphy came back from Vietnam, grew a beard, grew long hair, wandered around, he was picked up by the police, he was shaved, he was made bald, what would Audie do? And that is Rambo. Uh, and uh, while most people who know the film know Rambo as kind of the main character with uh, the, the police chief as a secondary character, uh, in the novel, the two characters have equal weight, and there were many reviewers at the time who felt that Rambo was the bad guy. Uh, just as some thought the police officer was, with neither of that was my intention. They're both, there are no antagonists in this. They're both, well, there are, they're both antagonists and they're both pro protagonists. And so the, the point of the novel was to use an action book and all the, all the readership you get in that genre in order to analyze without talking about the war, without talking about anything that was going on in American society at the time, but nonetheless to analyze that particular terrifying moment in American history. So you, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between the book and the film in a minute, but um, I, we have one question that was submitted in advance for you. Um, which I understand there's an interesting story about how you found out that the book had been optioned. Um, is, that, is that true? Well, let's think about this. Uh, there were two, there's, there's a story, but I'm not sure uh, that question will go to it. Uh, the first person to option the book was Stanley Kramer. Uh, and Stanley, God bless him, I, I admire his work. He didn't come through with the money. We, we had given up the option, he had it, and six months passed by and he got in touch and said, um, it's not going to happen. So my publisher had already taken out ads <laughs> made by, to be made by Stanley Kramer. I, I have a sense of humor about all this, I can't stop laughing sometimes. So uh, a producer named Lawrence Terman, who had uh, co-produced The Graduate, uh, was in a bookstore in Beverly Hills and he found the book. And as he paged through, he said, this is a movie. And he went to Columbia Pictures where Richard Brooks uh, was assigned to write and direct it. Uh, and I, I had the honor of actually being flown out to meet with uh, Richard Brooks. I, I admire him greatly, um, particularly his Westerns. 
uh, and I spent an afternoon in his home and we didn't quite see eye to eye on the movie. And uh, the next thing I knew I was on a, imagine I was this young professor and we didn't see eye, Richard Brooks and I did not see eye to eye. Can you imagine? So the next thing I knew I was on a flight back to Iowa City where I, where I taught. Uh, Brooks worked on the picture for a year. I do not know what happened, but Columbia sold it to Warner Brothers. And uh, uh, there were many rumors that, uh, for example, Marty Ritt was going to direct with Paul Newman playing the police chief. Um, I have no way of knowing that for sure, but I do know in conversation I personally had with Sidney Pollock that Sidney, an, a favorite of mine, was going to direct with Steve McQueen as Rambo. And they were a few months away from shooting when somebody pointed out the obvious, which was that Steve was in his mid 40s in 1975 when the shooting would have occurred. And there were no 45 year old Vietnam veterans in 1975. It was a young person's war, unlike the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which tended to have people in their 30s and 40s and even their 50s. So that dropped out, and then it went to another. Um, it went to another studio, and I'm a little little uncertain about how the rights went back and forth. But Carolco, a distributor, Andrew Vanya and Mario Kassar, um, were talking to Ted Kotcheff about him working for them, and they said, "Ted, if you had to make a movie, what would you really want to do?" And he said, "I worked on First Blood at Warner." And that's what I'd like to do. So they acquired the property for Ted and then move forward. So, uh, you know, from, from what I've read and I've seen some of your comments about it, uh, unlike some other authors like Stephen King, uh, you, you like the film, right? I, mean, I you do. Thought the film came out, came out really well, um, yeah. which seems a little unusual. Um, what would you say was the most, um, I guess, uh, interesting part of the initial experience of Having because you, you did not write the screenplay. No. Uh, you it was just it was you just sold basically the rights to the to the film uh, to be adapted. Um, was it the relationship with the, with the producers? Was it uh, what was what was what's uh, what put you at ease about the adaptation? Well, uh, the there are a couple of funny stories here. There's a there's a there's an interesting one. Producers do not phone novelists. Uh, I mean, if 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 a producer were to phone a novelist, it's they'd phone Stephen King, right? But I was young and innocent, and one day I did get a call from Andrew Vanya, uh, whom I call Andy. Um, and over the years, we had many many conversations, which never happens with with production teams. And the first time I heard from Andy is he said, "We're your novel is set in Kentucky." Um, and we're going to move it. We're going to shoot it in the Pacific. We're going to shoot it in Canada and doubling for the Pacific Northwest. And um, imagine anybody, a, a producer, asking the novelist this question, is there a reason why we couldn't do this? He said, we, we get a better money advantage if we're in Canada. We can, the dollar will go farther and we got grants and things like that. But we don't want to go up there and find out we can't make the movie because there's something in the plot that necessitates Kentucky. So do we have a problem? I said, go right ahead. There's not a problem. And so he and I often talked that way if he had, you know, questions about this or that. Um, I, I really, he's no longer with us, but I, I really, I, I, I like Mario, but I didn't speak as much to Mario as I, I did to Andy. And uh, anyhow, uh, the glamour of the movie world. Uh, so I was a, a young professor, uh, married to children, still married. Um, the, um, the, I, what I wanted to do, they, uh, uh, I had to see the movie because people were going to interview me. So uh, uh, Orion, which was the distributor for Carol Co., uh, said, well, we're going to show it to you on a Wednesday afternoon at this theater, and it opens on Friday. So uh, I said, this is great. I'll invite our friends, and I'll pay for the popcorn and the drinks and the jujubes and all that stuff, and we'll just have a great time. And Orion said, there's no way that's going to happen. We're only going to allow you, your wife, and the, your two children to see this movie on, on this Wednesday afternoon. And I thought, 
do they need the ticket sales that much <laughs> that they can't have you know a dozen people come in the afternoon so the four of us it, it, this was not theaters as they are now this was a huge theater and we go in two o'clock on a wednesday afternoon sit down the kids didn't want to sit with us so they you know gee what a shock uh, and the movie starts and uh well i was overwhelmed uh, i mean this was a huge screen and here comes sylvester walking down through the trees and i i mean it was just amazing so we all walked out uh, i still remember the feeling of walk, leaving the theater and the sunlight that afternoon as reality comes back and i didn't know what i'd seen uh, it was the same but it was different and i'm not complaining about that um, and uh, so I went home and I had a friend well, who taught also in the English department at the University of Iowa. So he phoned and he said, uh, what'd you think of the movie? And I said, I, the four of us sitting in this cavernous theater, I have no idea. And he said, well, let me ask it a different way. You'd know if it was bad, right? I said, oh, it's not bad. That much I know. So uh i had made friends with the manager because we were there that afternoon the, the five of us with the manager and the projectionist and i'd made friends with him he said you come opening night friday and he said i'll set i'll have this seat that that uh, it'll say reserved so nobody can sit there you come early you 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 go into the go into my office because we don't want to you know make this artificial and then when the movie starts, you come out and sit there and watch the reactions. So, okay, I did that. And things are moving along. You know, it's a lyrical opening and we have to have Rambo be sympathetic. So the, one of the guys he was with in Vietnam died from Agent Orange, which is not in the novel. Uh, and, and then the fight starts in the jail and people were screaming and yelling and shoving each other. Uh, I mean, it was like almost as if the fight were going on in the theater. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a huge movie. And indeed it was. And, uh, but I never got over sitting there in that back, I mean, snuck out and sitting there and, and watching their, their reactions to the, to the film. What, um, what was your relationship like with Sylvester Stallone? He has, he has a screenwriting credit on the film. Correct? Yes, he does. Um, so what were your conversations with him like? I didn't have any with the Sly for the first film uh, or for the second one, um, and, and, which isn't unusual. Uh, um, the, uh, there was no reason to, uh, but um, uh, as the movies continued, uh, he and I uh, talked increasingly. Um, and uh, for the, I'm often asked if I thought of anybody who could have been the actor portraying Rambo. And remember, 1972, Sylvester did not have the career yet. Um, and I had in mind perhaps Chris Christopherson, uh, who was uh, who had that shaggy, bearded, long hair, hippie look, and and did eventually make an action movie like Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, although he didn't have the the, the beard in that movie. Um, but, um, you know, times change and I wasn't married to, to that concept. I just thought it was interesting. And um, I first met uh, Sylvester uh, uh, at MGM. Uh, I was out there doing something and somebody said, well, you've never met Sly. And I said, no. And they said, oh, well, we'll send you over to MGM. So he was making a Rocky over there. I forget which, which, what number it was. And so I went over and, and we said, hello. And um, the issue here is that when I hear Rambo, it's become so much a part of the culture that it takes me perhaps a second or two to say, hey, that's my guy. And I said that to Sylvester and he said the same thing back to me, that he'd be going someplace and doing something and they'd be talking about Rambo. And it took him a moment to, to remember he played Rambo on the screen. I thought that was a you know very interesting conversation. But as, as time marched on, I was on the set uh, for Rambo 3 in Israel and also in Yuma, Arizona. And, um, we talked often there and over the years since then we've talked often uh, on the phone uh, 
Um, we're not, I've never gone to dinner with him. So I, I, that's one of my kind of uh, baselines for whether you're a friend or not is if you've eaten meals with somebody. But uh, we've certainly had long, long conversations over the years on, on, the, on the phone. And uh, what about some of the other cast members like Richard Crenna and uh, Brian Dennehy who just passed away? Um, did you ever have, uh, Richard Crenna certainly was in a couple of the films. Well, I, I, I live in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Brian uh, Dennehy he lived in the New Mexico, uh, in Santa Fe, also in, in the uh, mid 90s. So I, I sort of, we weren't close, but I did have conversations with him. Nice man, as big in person as he is on the screen, uh, very smart, uh, obviously a gifted actor. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the script um, doesn't, the, the character isn't on the screen the way it is. And I, I'm not complaining here, but uh, apples and oranges. But in the novel, Teasel gets half the book. The, the, the novel alternates viewpoints. Teasel, Rambo, Teasel, Rambo, Teasel, Rambo. Because I don't want the reader to take sides. I want the reader to say, yeah, this guy is right, that guy's right. Oh, maybe this guy's right. No, that guy's right. Uh, and the movie doesn't do that. The movie chooses Rambo as the guy. Um, so Brian didn't have a lot. He didn't have, he fills the screen, but he does not have a lot of screen time. Uh, and so he used his genius as an actor in order to dominate the scenes that he had. Um, but I had many conversations with Richard Crenna, uh, uh, particularly um uh in in uh in in israel uh he and i spoke uh at length a couple of times and uh we spoke on the phone and also we got to spend a day together and this again is so crazy about uh, how novelists are or are not treated when rambo 3 premiered uh debuted uh whatever the word would be for a, for a film um uh, and again, uh, this, this is impossible to imagine. Uh, the distributor, uh, TriStar in this case, decided that Sly would represent the film, that Richard Crenna would represent the film, and that I would represent the film. So we were the three people at the press junket doing, doing all the interviews. And that was mighty interesting. And uh, I, I didn't get a chance to spend much time with Sly at that occasion, but I spent a lot of time with Richard. And Richard was just an amazing person. He was, he was generous and kind. And uh, we, we, were, we were in a hotel coming down on an elevator to go to the junket. And as we came out of the elevator, there was a man with his little boy. And the little, I cannot remember what the little boy idolized Richard. Richard was in everything. So what he, what he idolized Richard for being in. Uh, but he, he uh, Richard took one look at the kid and the kid said, oh, there's Richard kind of went out. We were, we were on the way. We had journalists and all. And instead, he just stopped everything, went over to the kid, he was started talking to him. And if my memory serves, they had a camera and I, took a picture of the father and Richard and the, and the boy. And that really, really stuck with me. And um, he, he was in um, body heat, of course, you know, he was only five minutes. He didn't like it when I, when I talked this way, um, cause you know, he's a movie star. And so five minutes in body heat, it's a, in his, in a certain way negligible. But I told him uh, several times that I didn't think that body heat would have worked if he hadn't been the husband, uh, that the menace, the quiet menace that he, he, he exuded in a, in a very short scene in a restaurant um, showed why he had to be killed if the plot was gonna be moved forward. And, uh, but he didn't like me, <laughs> he didn't like me saying that. Well, there is a, you, you did tell me a very interesting little piece of trivia. He was not the original Actor no, cast he was not. Uh, he was not. Kirk Douglas was cast as uh, as uh, Troutman, and went to British Columbia. He was in costume. There are uh, there's artwork of him in costume that was published in Hollywood Reporter, um, and um, there's some mystery here. Uh, he 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 was there apparently from Monday through Friday. 
And whatever happened, you know, the old famous creative differences. Um, and I admire Kirk Douglas uh, uh, as much as anybody. So I'm, I'm not interested in trying to find some negative reason why he would have left. Uh, but he left. Uh, and that was on a Friday afternoon and they had shooting to do. One day those, those cameras were going to roll. So Lynn Stallmaster, who was the casting director for uh, the film and who also lived here in Santa Fe for a time and whom I had conversations with, uh, told me that his, his stressful weekend that he had to find a replacement for Kirk Douglas and get him on set Monday morning in Canada. Uh, and uh, and settled on Richard Crenna because you could say he's the ultimate professional. Uh, that I mean, he'd been an actor from when he was you know a, a little 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 kid, and he'd been in everything: comedy, drama, uh, it, all kinds of different genres. And if there was anybody who was going to step in not having barely had time to read the script but a couple of times and step in and and exude the confidence that he does in the role it, it was it was Richard and and uh, I don't know I just admired the guy a lot yeah, it's hard to picture Kirk Douglas playing the role unless you say uh, it well it would have been different uh, Gene Hackman at one time was was talked about I saw this in the trades uh, was going to be the Brian Dennehy role uh, so, I mean, you know, these things go in different ways and, and who knows why actors are or are not in the, in the role, but um, I mean, yes, it, it is, Richard is so good in the role, so, so quietly lethal. Uh, uh, and at the same time, kind of paternalistic toward this person he created uh, that uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, he did very well. Uh, so, you, you know, you've touched uh, a little bit on about some of the differences between the, the film and the book um, and, you know, the location and um, the, the character of the police chief, uh, you know, taking sort of a backseat to Rambo. Um, I, I think enough time has passed that we don't necessarily have to say spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> but uh, can, you, can you talk about, uh, I know that some people have, have a, the, the ending of the book versus the ending of the film uh, yeah. takes, creates a little bit of a, created, at least a little later on, when you were working on some of the other novelizations, a little bit of an issue. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there are differences. Um, uh, 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 we, we discussed Kentucky becomes the Pacific Northwest. Um, yeah, it, spoiler alert, whatever, Rambo dies at the end of the novel, just as the police chief dies at the end of the novel. And the person who kills Rambo is Troutman. Troutman shoots him, takes his head off with a shotgun. And this is part of the allegory that there are no winners in the system. If there is a winner, it's the system. The system that creates Rambo destroyed it. Uh, so uh, the first cut of the film for audiences, in that cut, Rambo died. Uh, and if you, those of you who maybe have a Blu-ray or even some of the older DVDs, there is footage of that that's been released. Uh, Rambo commits suicide. Uh, he and Troutman are talking. Troutman has a gun. Rambo grabs the gun and shoots himself. Um, in the test audience and in Las Vegas, Nevada, audiences were not happy. Uh, they'd been sort of conditioned about Rocky and Sly and Triumph and they cheered for him and now he was dead and they were not happy. Uh, and Ted Kotcheff in some recorded interviews has had some funny stories about how they were threatening to lynch him and the audience was. And so Andy and Mario um, told me that they had not intended sequels up until they had to reshoot the ending. And then when the film was a hit, they said, oh wow, we can actually make more of these movies. It was not in the plan. Uh, so that's, that's a significant difference. Uh, the, the, the novel has much more of Teasel and, and, and important in terms of the different train tracks of interpretations. In the novel, Rambo is young enough to be Teasel's or put it another way, Teasel is old enough to be Rambo's father. Teasel was a war hero in Korea. 
he was he knew about conventional war and he thought as a consequence he knew how to handle somebody in the mountains who was waging guerrilla war but obviously he didn't uh, so to me Teasel represented if we like an eisenhower republican attitude if rambo represented a disaffected kind of students for a democratic society kind of person uh, so we had uh, the generation conflict, which was uh, something very important at the time. The the password, uh, for, the byword for students was don't trust anybody over 30. Uh, and uh, clearly, Teasel was far older than that. So what we have is father-son in conflict in the novel. In the movie, they're the same age. So now it's brothers at war. And that, in turn, adds a different kind of uh, psychological dynamic to it. And in terms of the war, the only sign we get that, that Teasel was in combat is very briefly when he sits behind his desk uh, at a moment of tension, the, the camera reveals a display of medals, of military medals behind him on the wall. Uh, leaning against the wall, so there, you know, there are uh, different way, different changes. But the the big change was from seventy two to eighty two. The change was that my Rambo was furious that he had gone over there, and what happened to him, and what he discovered about himself that he was good at killing, so angered him that. Uh, he was primed when the police officer decided he didn't like the looks of him. Uh, so that's the novel. But by 1982, it's a whole different world. And what be, what happens with Rambo in the movie is that he's not a, he's not furious. He's a victim. Uh, and that difference might account where there, why there were 26 scripts before this picture got made because the United States was changing so fast from 72 to 82. Uh, speaking of the scripts, you know, you said that producers don't normally talk to novelists, but your producers did. Um, did you have, were you, did you have script approval in your contract or was there any arrangement? Was there anything official? Did they have to run these changes by you or did well, they do it just because they were nice guys? If you walk on water, you get script approval. Otherwise, you do not. Uh, J.D. Uh, 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 Rowling had um, uh, script approval, I'm told. Uh, I, I'd have to rack my brain to think of a novelist who had script approval apart from her. Uh, maybe Steve King, Stephen King does. I have no idea. Um, but uh, no, when you sell the rights, that is an act of faith that someone will actually make a movie. Uh, I, I know some people who have who've been, uh, you know, who are overjoyed if their novel sells. But then I say to myself, OK, let's wait. If if the movie gets made, what's it going to be like? You might wish that movie was never made. Uh, but Andy and Mario knew how to bring together. I mean, if you get Ted, Ted Kotcheff, you get um, Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, where would where would First Blood be without Jerry Goldsmith's music? Um, uh, uh, the cinematography. Uh, er, I'm I'm drawing a blank. I think it's Ernst Laszlo. Um, uh, a, a, a remarkably well photographed film. I mean, there the whole thing ha just is is filled with quality. And um, so I I have I have no complaints uh, uh, about the film. But interestingly enough, since you, you wrote the novelizations for the next two films, the yes. novelization version, um, so you were basing those on scripts that someone else had written. Yes. So, so, so you were, uh, what was it like to be adapting work based on your character that didn't originate with you? <laughs> See, this gets so meta. I'm, I'm, a, I'm such a fan of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, and all the meta stuff. Uh, I mean, this whole experience got very meta. So and I was a professor, so I love, I love talking this way. So this is this is what happened. Um, Andy phoned me and said we would like to have a novelization for Rambo Two, uh, and as it happens, you're the only one, me, David, the only one who could write the novelization because it's in my contract. When I sold the rights, I'm the only one who can write novels about Rambo. 
Now, at the time, novelizations were a big deal. Uh, the uh, uh, you the VHS rental system had not yet been established. Uh, certainly, DVDs didn't ex exist, and and Lord knows, streaming didn't exist. So, if you wanted to re-experience a favorite movie, you bought the novelization. So the novelization then mostly had to be what I called the author as photocopier um, because uh, the, the production company would, would in the contract to the novelizer say, you can't change anything. Uh, you must use the dialogue as written. You must use the plot as written. All you can do is describe the way people look, and that's got to look like the people in the movie, and describe the locations in the movie and put in a bunch of thoughts and emotions. Uh, and I, I just wasn't interested. I, I you know, it, it isn't, that wasn't a creative thing for me. Uh, but, um, Andy sent me, uh, this is in the days of, uh, you, of, of FedEx when it first started, and I was getting ready to go teach, and it's eight o'clock in the morning, and the doorbell rang, and here's a FedEx guy, and he's got, he's got a package, which I open it up, and it's a videotape, and I put it in, and it's the scene, uh, and he was so smart. It's the scene where Rambo in the helicopter arrives with Jerry Goldsmith's movie or music, uh, blasting away for Rambo 2 and he, he he shoots all the watch towers and he lands and he jumps out with the uh, uh, with the machine gun and and I I remember thinking this is gonna be a big movie so he called me again and he said you sure you don't want to do this you really should you I we think you want to be associated with this we think that it would be good for everybody so I said, but here's the thing, it's an 86 page script. We're talking now about Rambo too, I just emphasize that. 86 page script, which is not long. Uh, average script, maybe 115 pages. Um, and it had a lot of white space with lines like Rambo jumps up and shoots this guy, Rambo jumps up and shoots that guy. And I said, Andy, I, <sighs> I said, if I'm going to do this, I have to make changes. Uh, for example, um, in the movie, there's a passing line that says, this is the prisoner of war camp that he escaped from, that Rambo escaped from. So in real life, I sort of think, I kind of suspect that the man going back to the prisoner of war camp that he escaped from might have a little reflection on this, might have sort of some emotions, which are not in the movie. And I don't mean to sound like I don't like the movie. It's a hell of a lot of fun. But there are, let us say, parts that might have been amplified. And, and that was one. So I said, Andy, I, you know, that's, I would play that up. And there are some other things I would play up. But even then, I'm not sure. I just don't know if I have enough for a book. Is there anything you can help me with? And he said, well, I don't know if it'd be any help, but there is the James Cameron script. So we have this. The James Cameron. The James Cameron. But he wasn't the James Cameron yet. I knew him from. Terminator, the first one, right? But he hadn't done Terminator 2, which was a Carol Co. picture. And, you know, he hadn't been, he isn't yet James Cameron. He's sort of graduated from the Roger Corman school of, you know, of, of filmmaking. And, but I knew who Cameron was. And I said, there's a script that Cameron did. And he said, yeah, we, we decided not to use it. It was too dark. Well, now, now we're talking too dark i i have to read this script and indeed the, the the picture would have started with troutman getting out of a of a military of, of a of government vehicle and entering a mental institution and going through various layers of the mental institution and different people in different states of 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 you know, whatever, going down to the basement where, where Rambo is locked like in a dungeon behind these, behind these bars and it, the, the, the dungeon is dark and there's a man outside holding a rifle, a soldier, and he says to Troutman, he broke the light again 
uh, I've got to be careful here because I don't know if children are listening. So I'll just, I'll do this a different way. He broke the light again. He thinks he's the blank, blank, blank prince of darkness. And uh, so once I received this script and I saw that, I said, well, yeah, I can do this. So my arrangement with Carol Cole was that I, there'd be one third sh shooting script, there'd be one third me, and there'd be one third James Cameron. And it had never been done before. The, the novelization was uh, six weeks on the New York Times list. And I think to this, to this day is probably the most unique novelization that was ever published. But it was a lot of fun to do. I had to write it rapidly, but it was so, once I, oh, Cameron, that script was so interesting, but it had a sidekick, Rambo had a sidekick, who was probably gonna be John Travolta because Sly had directed Travolta in Stan Alive. And, uh, and obviously he can't have a sidekick. So, you know, that was the end of that script. All right, uh, why don't we take a couple of questions uh, that have been submitted. Um, you spoke a little bit before about, uh, we, you, some, uh, you talked about who else might have been considered to play Rambo. You said Chris Christopherson, were they, mm -hmm. was there anybody officially under consideration besides Stallone or was it him from the well, beginning? Well, as I said, uh, Steve McQueen was, was, that was definite. That wasn't a, well, we'll see. Sidney Pollock told me they were ready to go before they had second thoughts because it just wasn't going to work with a 45 year old Vietnam veteran. There were, uh, there, uh, there was a article in the LA times called the curious evolution of John Rambo. And that was published in 85. And that's part of a limited edition uh, of my novelization that Gauntlet Press released uh, recently uh, signed numbered hardback. And, and that essay is in, is with the, with the book. And, uh, and, and according to that, um, um, uh, perhaps John Travolta was in fact thought about as Rambo. I just don't see it. Michael Douglas, uh, th there was some talk about Paul Newman, but as I said, my information was that he was going to be the, the police chief. So, um, uh, uh, apart from McQueen, there was nobody that I know of that was absolutely, uh, in, in, assigned for it. Uh, here's another question. <laughs> uh, with the novelization for the second film, how did you get around the fact that he <laughs> dies at the end of the first book? Well, that was the problem. That was another reason why I kept saying, I just don't know if this is going to work because Rambo is dead at the end of the novel. So what's all this? And, and by now I was sort of, I was, by now, once I'd read the Cameron script, um, I thought, this, this could be a lot of fun. I like, you know, I, I, over the years, I finally decided that my career is based upon reinventing genres so, or forms or what have you. So try to shake up the novelization form. But I just didn't know. I thought this is a problem. So my friend Max Allen Collins, uh, uh, who, who lived in Iowa when I lived there, and Max is known for doing the Dick Tracy, later Dick Tracy comic strip, and of course the graphic novel, the brilliant graphic novel, The Road to Perdition. And you, you were telling me you have, you know, do you know Max? I can't remember what we, uh, what we talked about. No, that wasn't me. Unfortunately, I don't know Max. Wasn't, I know, okay. I know the work. I, I do know okay. Road to Perdition. That it was somebody else who said, oh, yes, he did. And then and it's not ringing a bell. But anyhow, so we met in a bookstore. Uh, how appropriate. Meta, meta, meta. So um, he said, it's very simple, David. And I said, well, if it is that simple, please tell me. And he said, all you need is a note at the front of the book that says, in my novel, First Blood, Rambo died in the films. He's alive. <laughs> that simple. And well, I mean, it's a dodge, obviously, but if you don't have a sense of humor, you know, you can't move forward. And I said, okay. And so, you know, that's at the start of the second and the third novelizations. Okay. Uh, we have uh, one more question. If anybody would like to um, pose any more questions, please do so. But we have one more right now. Um, so there is a special edition of First Blood with an added first chapter. Yes. Uh, is, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, the uh, Gauntlet Press, as I mentioned, a uh, specialty publisher for collectors, uh, did uh, signed numbered hardbacks, 500 copies, First Blood, Rambo 2, and Rambo 3. 
Um, and uh, I was a professor, as I said, and I admired the Norton critical editions when I was in, when I taught. You'd have the text, and then you'd have all this other stuff, you know, es letters and essays and whatever. And so I said, I'm going to make these three collectors' editions my Norton critical editions for the Rambo stuff. So what can I do for First Blood that would be different? Well, I thought, and I'm I'm always the teacher. I thought. Uh, there was a first chapter that was never used. Uh, and and uh, the chapter begins, the, 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 the insecure novelist in me, writing my first book, decided that I'd start with a big action scene with Rambo rushing through the forest with the helicopter chasing him. And the scene would be narrated from the viewpoint of the two guys in the helicopter. And it's a very exciting scene. Uh, uh, but once you've done that, first of all, we don't know who these guys are. We don't know who Rambo is. And then the action starts, but it's really not the start of the story. So where do we go from there? It was wrong. The rest of the book went up in a flashback and it was, it just wasn't, it wasn't going to play. So I, I finally decided that the, 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 the start of the book was Rambo coming to town and as in the movie and, and the police chief saying, you know, you just don't look right to me. Uh, and, uh, and this sentence came to me, his name was Rambo and he was just some nothing kid for all anybody knew. Uh, and okay, I could run with that. And I began uh, writing the novel in a straightforward timeline, no flashbacks. Uh, but that, that chapter uh, in its own way is a pretty neat chapter. So the, the first blood special edition, which is available. Well, it's it, actually, they sold that out. You might get it on eBay. Um, uh, but the other, the two and three are still available from Gauntlet Press. Um, uh, I thought that's going to be pretty cool. So I'll, I'll put that in there. And then I put in a lot of other things that were relevant to the, um, to the to the novel and how I I wrote it. All right, uh, we have one more question. This will, I guess this will be our, our capper. Um, what did you think of the most recent film? Well, um, my feeling about the film is that it's not a true Rambo film. Uh, that it could be about somebody named John Smith. Uh, that that there are if we want to to take the timeline from my novel, which is different. And we, if we want to go just even from the movies forward, there are things that are established in there's first four movies that the fifth movie contradicts. Uh, and there are logical inconsistencies and in, in, in just a number of other things. And uh, so I just, I guess I just don't consider it part of the Rambo canon. Uh, and, um, you know, what's to be done, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's out there, but I can't, uh, I don't want to say much more than that about it. Fair enough. Well, David, thank you very much. This has been great. Uh, as, well, a fan, as a fan of the uh, movies uh, since I was a kid, uh, this has been a real treat for me, especially. And I'm going to go back and reread the book now, too. Oh, well, thank uh, you. It's... <laughs> my copy's been sitting on my, uh, on my shelf for a long time since I first read it. I'm going to go dig it out again. Um, thank I you very thank much. Thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, again, if you are so inclined, please visit our website. Uh, you can get all our upcoming programming. Please consider making a donation or becoming a member. It really helps us in these times when we're social distancing and our doors are closed. Um, I want to thank David again. Uh, and uh, if you have anything coming up uh, soon or coming out again, maybe we can do this again sometime, David. Sure, it was fun. The hour went very swiftly. Yeah. Oh, for me, anyhow, God knows what everybody's suffering out there, but for me, it went very swiftly. Uh, speaking for myself, I thought it was great. Time flies when you're having fun. Good night, everybody. Thanks again. See you next time. David, thank you. Yeah, that, that went swiftly. Yes. I was uh, so... Uh, I've still got to work on these lights. I'm not sure I like them, but at least you could see me. So, you know. Much, much appreciated for everybody who's still on. I'm sure we could uh, express our gratitude. Um, fantastic evening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, I, I, I look forward sometime in the future to being in touch again. Thank you very much again. Have a good night. Okay. Good night.